As if you didn't already know, <laughs> today's Easter Sunday. It's the day that we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. It's going to be celebrated in, in many different ways all over the world today by Christians that we don't even know. But what's it really all about? Is it about family and eggs and bunnies and ham and, and potatoes? It, is it even about a set of religious beliefs? That's what I want to look at today because I think that even here in the church, there's often a great misunderstanding about the events of this day and what they mean. So first, let's talk a little bit about the reality of the resurrection. The resurrection really happened, people. It's not some fairy tale made up by the early church. It was a real historical event with many witnesses declaring what had happened. 1 Corinthians 15, 3 through 8. Paul writing here says, I received what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and he appeared to Peter and then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. And then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. And last of all, he appeared to me also as to one abnormally born. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is the greatest event in the history of the world. I hope you understand that and can grasp that. So many witnesses saw Jesus alive after he died on that cross that any court of law in this country would agree with the evidence. The scripture we just read mentions 500 people who saw Jesus alive after he was resurrected out of that grave. 500 now, and the Bible names others who also saw the risen Lord. That's not the only people. Now, let me ask you a question this morning. If you were accused of a crime and the prosecution brought in one by one over 500 people who said they saw you commit that crime, what are the chances that you would be convicted? I'd say around 100%. That's the certainty of the resurrection, folks. More people saw Jesus alive after he died than saw Columbus discover America. You ever thought about that? One we treat as a historical fact. We teach it. The other we say, uh, well, I don't know. I guess if you have enough faith, you could believe that. And when they say the word faith, they mean like faith in UFOs and the tooth fairy. Folks, the resurrection happened. It was witnessed. And while it can be called a matter of faith, it is also a part of the historical record and an event that changed the world. Why? Because it happened. That's why. So then the question becomes not so much, did it happen? Instead, the question becomes, so what? Since the resurrection actually took place, what is the importance of the resurrection? Why does it matter to you and to me, to anyone? What's the significance? We find the answer in 1 Corinthians 15, 14 and 17. If Christ has not been raised, your preaching is useless and so is your faith. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile you are still in your sins. So people, if the resurrection didn't happen, what we've been doing in this room today here is a big joke. Worse yet, it's a cruel and it's a sinister hoax perpetrated upon mankind by the church. It's a capital offense. We should all be hung for it if the resurrection didn't happen. 
If the resurrection didn't happen, then the words I speak to you here today are a lie. And as Paul says, our preaching is useless. Now, some of you here today might just agree after this message that my preaching is useless. That's okay. It's a free country. But, But there's more. If the resurrection didn't happen, Paul says your faith is both useless and futile. It's a joke. And we who believe are all fools who have bought into a lie. We're to be pitied above all men, he says later. We've lost our minds. And worse yet, if the resurrection didn't happen, then Paul says, rightly so, you and I are still in our sins. Now we're going to get down to the meat of this whole resurrection thing. The purpose of the resurrection Why? Why would God lower himself to come to this mean, dirty, unholy earth in the person of Jesus and suffer the hardships of this world when he could have stayed in heaven instead? Why would God come to earth in Jesus and suffer the pain, being mocked, spit on, beaten up, whipped, crucified on a cross. And aside from the pain and humiliation, why did God raise Jesus from the dead? What is the purpose of the resurrection? Both Peter and Paul wrote to the early church to answer this question. And this is important today, folks, because there are people within the church trying to change the meaning of the resurrection They don't like to talk about sin. After the resurrection, witnesses almost immediately, they began to speak of what they had seen and heard. And almost immediately, the religious authorities tried to shut them up, killed some of them. And here in Acts 5, we hear Peter speaking to those Jewish authorities face to face, standing up to them in the power of the Holy Spirit. Acts 5, 28 through 31. We gave you strict orders not to teach in his name, he said, yet you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching and are determined to make us guilty of this man's blood. Peter and the other apostles replied, we must obey God rather than men. The God of our fathers raised Jesus from the dead whom you had killed by hanging him on a tree. And God exalted him to his own right hand as prince and savior, listen to this, that he might give repentance and forgiveness of sins to Israel. Peter is saying here, we're going to keep on preaching this stuff and you can't stop us because God raised Jesus from the dead so that he might give repentance and forgiveness of sins to the world. There you have the purpose of the resurrection, the forgiveness of sin through repentance. Uh, You uh, you might want to write that phrase, forgiveness of sins, on your notes, mark it in your Bibles. It's the big idea for today because that's what Easter is about. But this forgiveness was not just for Israel. It was for the whole world. And Peter later preached to some Gentiles who were different than the Jews. And he said this in Acts 10. We are witnesses of everything he, Jesus, did in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They killed him by hanging him on a tree, but God raised him from the dead on the third day and caused him to be seen. He commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one whom God appointed as the judge of the living and the dead. You're going to see Jesus again someday. He's going to judge you. All the prophets testify about him that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. Here, Peter was speaking to some non-Jewish people and said to them the same thing that he said to the Jews. Through faith in the resurrection, they could receive, and here's that phrase again, forgiveness of sins. But it wasn't just Peter who preached this message. Paul the apostle was speaking to some Greek people 
in Acts chapter 13, and listen to what he says. Different apostle, different place, different people. But the one whom God raised from the dead did not see decay. Therefore, my brothers, I want you to know that through Jesus, the forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you. Through him, everyone who believes is justified from everything you could not be justified from by the law of Moses. So there's that phrase again, the forgiveness of sins. And I want you to look at those three scriptures again. I don't know, if, I can't remember if we put those up or not, but I'll read them real quickly. Acts 5.31, God exalted him to his own right hand as prince and savior that he might give repentance and forgiveness of sins to Israel. Acts 10.43, everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. Acts 13, but the one whom God raised from the dead did not see decay. Therefore, my brothers, I want you to know that through Jesus, the forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you. Do you think it might be about forgiveness of sins? It's constantly and consistently tied in the scriptures to the resurrection event. And that's why Paul said earlier in that Corinthian passage that if the resurrection didn't happen, you are still in your sins. Forgiveness of sins is the purpose of the resurrection. And I don't care what some theologian with 18 degrees says, it's plain as day in the Bible. Now in churches all across America today, many will speak about the glory of the resurrection. Many will address the hope of the resurrection. Others will teach the power of the resurrection or the miracle of the resurrection. But I'm telling you, far fewer will speak about the forgiveness of sins that is directly tied to that resurrection, even though that's the main purpose of it. Why? Because preaching about the forgiveness of sin doesn't always produce smiley faces that go along with the traditional Easter egg hunt. Easter bunnies and egg hunts and pretty little dresses, they don't seem to match up with the shedding of blood for the forgiveness of sin. It's, a, it's, too, it's too tough a topic for such a nice family day. Forgiveness of sins tends to get way too personal also because I'll, I hate to break it to you, he's talking about your sins and mine. There is no one in this room to whom this does not apply. But it's unavoidable if we actually read and believe the scriptures. It's unavoidable if we believe the gospel story. Jesus came, Jesus died, and Jesus rose so that we could experience forgiveness of sin. Something that every one of us desperately needs. That's the Easter message. And I could stop and go home now, but I'm not going to. So if God sent his son Jesus to die and rise again for the forgiveness of sins, what is what I would call the product of the resurrection? What does it produce when we believe? What is God looking to produce here on earth among his people? Scripture has an answer if we will listen. 1 Peter 1.3 Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In His great mercy, He has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Notice the phrase, through the resurrection. Peter says the resurrection can produce basically two things in those who will believe and embrace the call of the gospel. First, new birth. It was Jesus who told the old religious man Nicodemus before he died, you must be born again. The new birth has been at the heart of the gospel since the birth of the church. The birth of the church happened because there is such a thing as new birth. The new birth is not an option for the one desiring to be a Christ follower. It is a necessity for becoming part of the family of God. It is the reason that Jesus will look at some people and say, 
no matter how religious they've been all their life, I never knew you because they have not been born again. Jesus said, you must be born again. Without the born again experience, we are doomed to an empty religious ritual. Religion that tastes good and does good, but it doesn't nourish our soul. New birth is also the secret of a changed life. The kind of life that God wants to produce in us. That, that life that Mike was talking about, if we take that out of this room and show it to others, will attract them to Jesus. A life that witnesses to the world and draws others to Jesus. That's his hope for you. Now, the other phrase here is living hope. And this is not just the hope for a changed life here on earth, but of course, the hope of a resurrection into the next life. The hope is living because it is tied to a living Jesus. It is tied to a living Savior, Jesus Christ. And we have been given this living hope because He lives. If there is no resurrection, we have no living hope. Keep those together. Paul the Apostle picks up on this theme. He gives us an additional product of the resurrection, Ephesians 1, verse 7. In Him, we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins. There it is again in accordance with the riches of God's grace. And here Peter uses another word that is a product of the resurrection. Redemption. Because of the resurrection, we can be redeemed. Now, we've talked about redemption here before, but let me go over it real quickly again with you. The best way to explain redemption is to talk about something that probably almost all of us did this week. Shopping. When we shop, many of us use what the business industry calls coupons. Now, coupons are fairly worthless pieces of paper that people cut out of a newspaper or out of a flyer and take them to the store. What do they say on them? If you read them, they say, this coupon is worth 50 cents, $1, $3, whatever the amount when used to pay for a certain product. Somewhere on that coupon, you will also usually find these words in really, really small print. The face value of this coupon is good for that product when redeemed with per participating merchants. The face value is also listed in something like one one thousandth of a cent. So you're not going to get rich collecting coupons and trying to sell them. In other words, it's a worthless piece of paper unless it is redeemed for that product. So something that is essentially worthless becomes something of value when it is redeemed. It works the same with us and Jesus. When we come to Jesus, He redeems us. He takes the worthless and the sometimes even destructive events of our life, and He redeems those so that even the bad things can become something of value when used to bring Jesus to the world. Jesus changes the purpose of our existence, our previous existence and our future existence. The resurrection changes the meaning of whatever has happened to us in our life. And believe me, as I look across this room, a lot of stuff has happened to some of you in your lives. Jesus can change the meaning of that. He can redeem them. Something useless can become something usable. Something of no value can become something of great value when redeemed. Redemption is a product of the resurrection. No resurrection no redemption. There's one more product of the resurrection found in Colossians 1, verse 13 and 14. Here's what it says. He has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son He loves, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. There's that redemption word again. There's that forgiveness of sins stuff again. But Paul adds another descriptive word, rescue. God rescues us from the power of death. 
He rescues us from our old lifestyle if we will turn and follow him. He brings us into his household. We come under his roof, under his care, under his protection, under his authority also, by the way. And many here today could stand and tell you stories of their deliverance when they did this and their rescue when Jesus came into their life and what he's done in their lives for them. He literally saved us. New birth, hope, rescue, redemption, forgiveness, all products of a resurrection. If the resurrection didn't happen, you don't have those. We're just making it up in our head. So there you have the purpose and the products that God intends for us to realize as the result of the resurrection. But there's more. Through Christ's life here on earth, he spoke consistently of the expectations of the resurrection. You see, listen, the cross is too high a price for God to pay so that we can just say, that's nice, I believe it, and then go on our merry way. I don't know how that gospel got started, but it's been floating around out there. Sign your name here on this line, and it's all, it's, that's all you have to do. You're free, you're in heaven, and then people just go on living like they've always lived. Being a Christian is more than believing a set of teachings or agreeing with certain doctrines. It's about living a resurrected life ourselves. To do that, we need a twofold understanding of the forgiveness that's found in the resurrection. First, we have to, A, obtain forgiveness. See, that forgiveness we've been talking about, it just doesn't happen automatically. We have to realize we are lost, confess our sin, and we have to repent or turn away from that sin, and we have to ask God to forgive us. Hey, look, I'm telling you, we do not deserve it. We can't earn it by being good. You cannot buy it. It must be obtained through heartfelt repentance. And then because of the resurrection, we can then receive that forgiveness from God, be reborn, and start a new life. And even though repentance is hard, I mean, because we got to confess our sins, it gets us to the part that most of us like. Our sins are forgiven, and we are forgiven. And that feels real good, folks. It's the beginning of a new life, a changed life. And, And in just a moment, you will have an opportunity to do just that. Repent and receive a new life. And for the life of me, I don't know why anyone would not accept a gift that big. But the part of the gospel that we don't like as much, the part that troubles us and even angers us at times, is what you might call the flip side of forgiveness. Not only are we called to obtain forgiveness, we are called to dispense forgiveness. I don't like the sound of that. I mean, there's some folks I want to hang on to the hate a little bit, you know? I mean, they did me wrong. I'm going to, I'm going to, I can't forgive them. What's God thinking? We have been forgiven by God. He commands us to forgive others. The New Testament has stories of people who received God's mercy, but then refused to grant mercy to others. And every time, the outcome is negative. Every time, Jesus condemns that behavior. Every time, he implies that they must not really know him. If we have received forgiveness, we are called to dispense forgiveness. In a way, we pay it forward. This is what Arlene did for her mother. And it took her mother's breath away. She forgave her. She didn't ask her to move in with her. (laughs) She didn't condone the addiction that caused her and her mother so much pain. 
She reinforced her boundaries instead of taking them down, but she released herself and her mother in one short sentence of three little words. I forgive you. Now, some of you in this room today have failed to find the complete freedom that Christ has to offer you because of your refusal to say those words. You have refused to forgive. Oh, oh, we've gone through the religious motions. We may have even been baptized, joined the church, whatever. We've been saved. We've been born again. But we carry around this, this dirty bomb called unforgiveness. And we do our best to act the part, but at any given moment, the dark side of the force can come and demand that we detonate that bomb. And it goes off. And that's because we have ignored and we refused to disarm it. Instead, we have protected it. <laughs> Frankly, some of us have even cherished that anger and that bitterness. We, we treasure it. Maybe it's time to call the bomb squad. We often wonder why God hasn't used us more. But we cannot serve God fully because we are serving our addiction to anger and unforgiveness. It's like we've got this, this closet in our lives, but we refuse to open it up. It stinks in that closet. There's rotten stuff in there, but we refuse to address it. Maybe we need to have a garage sale. Like Arlene and our flicker today, we just need to get the work of forgiveness done. She didn't relish it, but she did it and she meant it. It may or may not help those that we forgive. That's immaterial. But it's actually beside the point because God promises that it will help those who do the forgiving. And that includes you and me. Refusing to forgive is not only Refusing to forgive is not only direct disobedience to God. It becomes a self-inflicted, crippling disease for those who refuse to obey. Are you listening to me? So what are our choices today? What, what do people do when confronted with the realities of the resurrection as we've gone over this morning? Well, we usually do one of three things. And I would just about bet that everyone in this room has done one of these three things. First, I call them the three R's of the resurrection. A, rejection. Our first option is to reject the message, reject the truth, reject God's offer. And frankly, some of you will leave this room today having done that. Just the fact of life. That's the way it works. We don't get to choose who that is. You're choosing. We can decide there... Well, it probably wasn't really a Jesus. Well, no resurrection. Sometimes I don't even believe in God. But our rejection doesn't change anything but us. And the facts are still the facts. Another form of rejection is that we can believe in God, even believe in Jesus, but we reject the call to repent and submit our lives to Him. When we do this, we are actually still rejecting God because what we're doing is we're, we're creating a God in our own image, a God that likes us the way we are. Instead of believing the God of Scripture who calls people to repentance. But rejection is almost always a temporary state. It really is. It's been said there are no atheists in foxholes. You ever hear that saying? I can also tell you with some authority in, in my 35 years of pastoring and sitting beside quite a few deathbeds, there are very few atheists on deathbeds. It's, it's, it's one thing to try to live our lives without God. It is totally another thing to try to die without God. And very few are stupid enough to try. Maybe that's why so many people go the route of the second R, religion. Religion has a good name. It looks outside of ourself. It believes in a God or a guru. 
but usually it's a god or guru of our own choosing, even our own creation. This God can be harsh and demanding, or He can be loving and lax. You choose. You're the one making up the God. Religion usually gets us involved in some kind of an organization, a church like this perhaps, a mosque, a synagogue, a lodge, a club, a fraternal organization, a place where we do good stuff. And we think that God will like us for doing good stuff. We figure he's up there somewhere keeping score. And if we just get enough points to overcome our negatives, we can probably make it to heaven. And we may develop rules and regulations or traditions that we think will please this God. We often begin to insist that everyone live the same way to be a true believer. That's religion. And now, this approach can help some with life. It really can. I mean, it can bring some order to a chaotic life, but it doesn't help with death because there is never any assurance that I've done quite enough good stuff to make it. It also tends to play down or dumb down the bad stuff that I've done and you've done. We tend to find someone out there who's a lot worse than us, and we say, well, at least I'm not as bad as them. But it's God we have to compare ourselves to, not others. Most religions with small gods and gurus are what I would call, I hope so, religion. I hope I can qualify for heaven. I hope I'm good enough to make it. But it's God's plan that through the resurrection that we have a know-it religion, a know-so faith. I know it. I feel it. I know it. And that's why there's a third R, relationship. God wants us to know Him personally. Read Genesis 1. That's what it was like in the garden. They knew one another personally. He's a living God, not a dead God. And He wants to have a relationship with you. And this is why God created us in the first place. God wants us to know Him. As a father knows a child... As a husband knows his wife, God wants a relationship. But but you know what? Many will spend their entire lives running from this relationship. Why do we do that? (laughs) Because, you see, we know that in any relationship, especially one like this, I have to give up some of my absolute autonomy to be in that relationship. In any real relationship that really matters, there is a cost. We have to give away some of our freedom. And for many, that's just too high a price to pay. And so we end up with this individualistic, narcissistic culture that we call the USA. But it's not just ours. It's a sin problem around the world. And so we run. We run. We run in a lot of different ways. But eventually we run out of places to hide. The booze, the drugs, the busyness, the nightlife, the music, the fame, the power, the career, the success. All of these eventually fall short and we end up in Jackson Brown's old song, Running on Empty. But God in His Word teach that when we walk in relationship with Jesus here on this earth, we will live in relationship with Him in heaven. That's a guarantee. So I want to ask you a question. If you would die today, if you would die tonight, do you know where you would spend eternity? Do you have a relationship with Jesus right now? Have you experienced the forgiveness found in the resurrection? Have you forgiven those who have caused you pain? Jesus came to earth so you could be forgiven. He rose so that we could have the power to forgive. He paid it forward for us. And he commands us to pay it forward for him and others. So I lift before you this morning 
a man named Jesus Christ, the risen Lord, the resurrected Son of God, the grace and mercy and the forgiveness of God in the flesh, taken down from the cross and set free in the world through the resurrection. God's answer to life and to death and to dying. God's answer to bitterness and anger and unforgiveness. The only answer that God has given to man. The only answer he will give. So if you're waiting on another one, you're being foolish. Given as an Easter gift, just like our gifts back there in the corner. Free, no strings attached. Given to the living and the dying, and that's every one of us here today. So, what should we do? I have two suggestions at the bottom of your note sheets. If you have any, not everybody has one, I know, but they're on the screen. It's a declarative sentence. I need the forgiveness that the resurrection provides in my life. I want to have a relationship with Jesus. Sign your name on that. If you believe that, that's what you want. If that's what you don't have that you need to leave this room with, sign there. Sign there if you want to get into a relationship with the Lord of heaven. And if you've never been born again or received the forgiveness of sin that Jesus offers, this is your day. Let God in. And there's a second sentence there, though, and, and that's for some of us who've been with the Lord for a while. I need to do the work of forgiveness through the power of the resurrection. Help me forgive, Lord. Sign your name if that's you. If you have someone you need to forgive, Christians, I, I, I don't like to pull rank on you, but Jesus commands this. Jesus is risen. He's risen to forgive. And it's time to go to work. Let's stand for prayer. Lord, as we stand here today, we, we stretch out these muscles and we thank you for the gift of freedom. And I pray, God, that everyone in this room will accept your gift, freedom that comes with the forgiveness of sin, freedom you bought on that cross and that was guaranteed to us through your resurrection. I pray for that. And I would pray, Lord, for those that have been maybe involved with this church for years and years, and, and, and they have been born again, but they've got this dirty room in their life where the stink of unforgiveness just won't go away. I pray you'll help them today to find a way to get that done. I know it's a choice. It's not a simple, not an easy choice, but it it really does just take a choice. So I pray for them. And Lord, as we close out this service today, I pray that you will help us to understand that every disciple that Jesus ever called, he called publicly. There were no secret disciples. And so we ask God that you would have people rise up and move out of their place and take a step forward for you. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm going, to, I'm going to call on you today that if you signed your name on that sheet and you are born again today, this is what you need. You want a relationship with Jesus. I'm going to ask you to come forward because we need to pray for you. We want to get you involved in some kind of a study. We want, we want you to grow and gain strength. So you come today if, if that's your case. And, 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 and look, even if you're just needing to forgive someone and you need some spiritual help with that, you step out from where you are and you come and we'll pray over you too. Today's your day. Let's move in.